Good morning. morning. And welcome to everybody on this uh, second Sunday of Advent. Glad you could come out on this kind of cold, damp morning, but a good time to get in and out of that. We have this beautiful place to come together for a little time. Before we get started this morning, get some of these announcements. Again, always a busy time of year. But as you open up that order of worship, it says this week at a glance, everything is pretty much listed there for you. This Wednesday, which is the 13th, uh, 6 p.m. is the bonfire and wiener roast at the Pope Farm. So uh, we won't have our regular services on Wednesday here, but uh, we'll all be going out to Pope Farm. So if you'd like to get directions to that, don't leave this place. We'll get you some directions how to how to get out to the uh, Pope Farm. Invite folks to come out. Um, not, they're not going to get preached at. This is a time of fellowship, but it's a good time to introduce people and say, hey, this is the, you know, the crazy folks at the church I go to. Come on out and get, get something to eat. See, I have a note here, a menu. Smoked steaks of the tube variety and Chef Mark's gourmet galopinto, which I believe is red beans and rice. Is that right? But it sounds better. We're having smoked steaks and galopinto, gourmet galopinto. So again, come out uh, for that time together. And then uh, next Sunday, uh, again, everything listed there for you. But that evening is our Sunday school program. Once upon a manger, uh, come and join as we bring the story of the birth of Jesus to life in an interactive Christmas program program highlighting our children and and youth. So mark your calendars for that next Sunday evening. And then you're also supposed to bring your goodies, uh, your your favorites, and afterwards we'll have a little time of fellowship and uh, whatever kind of Christmas cookies and cupcakes or whatever you like to bring uh, on that evening. Again, on the back, uh, mark in your calendars. Everything is listed there. I might point out uh, January 7th uh, annual reports for the council are due uh, so we can get uh, ready for our annual meeting as we close out this year. Remember our blessing table each week and thank you for your help in keeping that ministry up. It's definitely getting used and there's uh, an important ministry. It has become that. So uh, again, use it. I see folks use it all, all the time. Uh, and uh, anyway, please silence your cell phones as you enter the sanctuary. And then also note about our children's programs on Wednesday night. Um, they put these together, kind of a Christmas blessing bag to, to go on our table back there. They put together a bunch of those, uh, uh, about 20 of them, I think. In it is a Bible, uh, some hygiene products, some spice cider, socks, uh, hot cocoa, a, a bracelet, candy cane, a Christmas card that they made, and a Christmas ornament. It's maybe some other stuff. I don't know. That's what I know. But those are there. Uh, the kids put that together so they could go on the blessing table, let you know a little bit about what the kids are do, doing on Wednesday night. But that's their participation in Christmas and being able to do those bags for those and maybe help brighten the time. So, all right. Any other announcements I'm missing this morning? Lots to pray about this time of year. I know a lot of folks, a lot of sickness going around between flus and respiratories and stomach thing and all that. So, folks, we need to pray for this morning. And however else God would lead you this time of year as we get ready to prepare our hearts to come before the Lord. Let's take time and let us pray.
Looking in your order of worship, we have a memory verse which we introduced last week for the month of December. So if you would uh, find that there, and you could say with me that reference before and after. We call this the Mark of the Christian. John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. John 13, 35. This morning we light this candle as a sign or a reminder of the coming light of Jesus Christ into this world. I heard a pastor this week that uh, I know in the covenant had mentioned that all of the Christian life is Advent, not just at this time of year. We wait for the second coming of our Lord, and that's what we're waiting for. So this Advent reminds us of our Lord came, and He is coming again as we light this Advent candle of peace. Reading from Isaiah, uh, the prophet, he writes about this uh, peace that is to come in Isaiah 11:6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Peace. Please stand and turn to number 277, Heart the Herald Angels Sing. Scripture reading this morning is found from Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11, if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles or your pew Bibles there. I 
And again, Isaiah the prophet, and as you notice, all of our readings for lighting the Advent candles are from Isaiah, who prophesied so many different details of the coming of the birth of Christ. Isaiah 41, Comfort, comfort my people, says your Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows upon them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up to the high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for them. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He greatly, lead, he gently leads those who have young. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Please stand and turn to number 267. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Almost 22 years. 
I guess. And uh, I was in my office one morning, you know, and been praying, and I would have swore I heard bells, you know, ringing. So I, I come out of my office, and I'm like, what is this sound? And I, and I follow, it was dark in here, some dark mornings, and I, I, I come in here, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to see an angel, you know, or, or something, but yeah, <laughs> had appeared. And as it turns out, lightning or UV light sometimes also turns them on, so I ended up finding the control. I think I had to call somebody how you turn the bells off, but I wasn't sure exactly what I got myself into. But anyway. <laughs> We can get our scripture reading this morning. No, not our scripture reading. We're going to pray next uh, in, that, uh, in the hymn book. And let's pray about what we just sang about, peace. And we live in a world of war uh, all around us. Hurt. Uh, millions, we're told, are refugees. No homes. No place to go. So let us go to the Lord this morning in prayer. Father, again, we come to you on this Sunday of Advent that we light this candle of peace. Dear Lord, again, praying for your peace to come to every man Man, woman and child dear Lord a peace our world doesn't understand a peace that they look for in absence of war but a peace that we'll only find in you it can only be found in our God the God of peace so help us as we look into those things this morning we pray that for our world and all the busyness and the rush that goes on and even the grumpiness and meanness sometimes it's accomplished with that men looking for peace in all the wrong places. So help us as a church, dear Lord, to be your peacemakers in this world, to point men, women, and children to you. Many this morning, dear Lord, disquieted many sicknesses. We talked about folks in nursing homes and hospital and trying to heal up at home and suffering with pain. Dear Father, in sickness, we pray for them and remember them. They don't get to come out this morning and join with us and hear these songs, dear Lord, and renew ourselves in this Advent time of year. So we pray for them especially, your spirit will minister your peace in their hearts and minds and souls and healing, dear Lord. Strength, dear Father. Of course, we'd have you to restore them to us. But in the meantime, dear Lord, that they be comforted as only they can by the mighty comforter, your Holy Spirit. So guide us this morning in your word. Thank you that we are privileged to be here this morning of all the places we could be in our lives. But somehow you worked it out in your direction and guiding and leading us as our shepherd that you led us here this morning to come together for a little while to share our voices and to sing some songs. Songs about you and songs about the great things that you have for us and songs about how you care for the sheep that you shepherd. Help us to renew ourselves in all these things this day and help us never to forget this is a privilege, dear Lord, to be able to come into your house. We pray your blessings on this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for that, man. This morning. Do we have any children this morning be dismissed to their time of children's church? I don't see any. Oh, we got one. That is the candle we light on this second Sunday of Advent. Now that varies from other traditions. They light the candles in a different order. But for us, it is the second Sunday of Advent. We light the candle of peace. You know, our world has defined peace in several different ways. Peace is the freedom from disturbance, tranquility, things like calm and restfulness and quiet and stillness. There's that kind of peace. Secondly, there is a state or period of time in which there is no war. No violence. There is in place order, peacefulness, harmony, friendship, and accord, as it were. In fact, that word a peace is used of a ceasefire and disturbances, but the absence of violence, that kind of peace. And then thirdly, is the ceremonial handshake or a kiss that exchanged during a service in some churches. We've talked about this in the past called passing the peace or the holy kiss or a kiss of peace symbolizing Christian unity and love. Now I was teaching the backstory, I was touching the backstory on that handshake of, of peace and custom. It is also related to driving on the left hand side of the road instead of the right hand side of the road like we do. In England, and many countries that came under British rule still to this very day, they drive on the left side of the road. In fact, I almost got ran over several times when I was privileged to get leave in London. You know, you walk up to an intersection, and I know as an adult, you know, a child look both ways before you cross. But we tend to get in a hurry, so we, you know, we look to the left, and if that's clear, we can go ahead and take a step off the curb. Then we look to the right as we head on out to make sure we can make our space through traffic. Well, you run up to a curb and I'd look to the left and start to step out and wham! It was, it was you, you turn this way your whole life for that first look and they're coming from the other direction to try and retrain your head to look the other way. It's pretty hard, that muscle memory is in there since you were, you were a kid. You see, what happened was most knights of old were right-handed. So they carried their lance on the right side in a saddle horster, and they rode their horses on the left-hand side of the road in case they came upon another warring knight. Coming down the road, all they had to do was to lift up their lance and lower it down, and it's on that right side, and they're on the left, and they'd charge down there, and the two of them would fight. Or if they were using a sword, they would draw their sword across with their right hand and pull it out. And then they could go down whacking because their horse was on the left and their weapon would be on the right hand side in the middle of the road. And then they would, they would fight. When the horseless carriage came along, the automobile, they just kept driving it on the same side of the road they always had. Kind of like that muscle memory. That's the way we always did it when we rode horses, so let's just keep doing it. When new two knights came face to face, standing on the ground, sizing each other up, not sure as to whether they would end up fighting each other or not, they would join right hands. The handshake was born. Well, it wasn't really so much a handshake that while you joined right hands, you couldn't draw your sword and whack each other to death. So as long as you held right hands together, you were at peace. Well, the handshake of peace. I always thought that was a pretty good commentary on mankind. We are either shaking hands or trying to kill each other. I mean, it's either war or peace, and they're about a handshake apart. Our world seeks for peace. But again, last Sunday we looked at hope. They're looking for it in all the wrong places. 
Let me give you a quote from old preacher D.L. Moody, founder of the Moody Bible Institute and the Church of the Open Door in Chicago. And I quote, and I'll maybe read it twice. He said, A great many people are trying to make peace, but that has already been done. God has not left it for us to do. All that we have to do is to enter into it. Unquote. Let me read that again. A great many people are trying to make peace, but that has already been done. God has not left it for us to do. All that we have to do is to enter into it. Unquote. You see, biblical peace is not just a state of calm or quiet, or is it the absence of violence or war. It is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ and is a response to His amazing grace. He is our peace. Peace is a person. It is the person of Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of peace. If you possess Him in you by the Holy Spirit of God, you have peace in you. If you walk in the Spirit, if you walk in that peace. The Bible's peace means completeness, wholeness, welfare, harmony, and well-being. It is often translated from the Hebrew word shalom. And also from the Greek word, eirene. Biblical peace is, is experienced by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and yielding to the Spirit of Christ as you walk in Him. We read in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7, How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news. That's the gospel, which means good news. Who proclaim peace who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. All of those are being used as synonyms in Hebrew poetry. Gospel, uh, good news, good tidings, salvation, peace. Because that's how you get peace. Bringing good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns, which is the other element. God's plan of salvation was to bring us back under His rule. If you want peace, you have to let God rule. Be the boss over us. All of salvation's story was how was he going to get mankind back under that rule because he chose to be back under that rule. The sub-theme was God's plan of salvation. The good news. Because of what God did for us and loving us while we were yet sinners, we might perhaps perchance just love him back and willingly submit to his kingdom. Jesus Christ is that peace. He is that shalom, that arene, that came into the world to proclaim the good news of salvation. He is a light shining in darkness to reveal to us his salvation, our peace, our shalom, because we are being saved. In second or John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus preached, Peace I leave with you to his disciples. My peace. I give you. It's His peace that He's giving. I do not give you as the world gives. You see, that's a totally different peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. There is no fear for Christ's disciples who walk in that peace. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, that's in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have it. We just don't live into it. We don't walk in that peace. And Isaiah, peace is connected to proclaiming the good news, the gospel. That definition of that gospel I've told you before, when you think gospel, think 1 Corinthians 15. It is the best definition of the gospel in scriptures. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I pass on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. The Gospel. 
the gospel of peace. Peace is believing the gospel that, gospel that Jesus Christ came and preached by both his words and by his life. As I've told you before, he was both the message, he was the gospel, and he was the messenger who brought that message to us as both prophet, priest, and king. So I'm going to take a few moments to look at some things about this peace, peace in Jesus. The Bible, our only rule for lay faith, life, and conduct. Just two things this morning. Talk about this kingdom of peace, and then I'd like to talk about that His is a kingdom of peacemakers. First, let's talk about this kingdom of peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. We read, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. And then Isaiah goes on to explain why there will be no more gloom. Verse 2, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as a people rejoice at the harvest. And again, lights have always been associated with Christmas because it remembers that light that came into our world. And the old church people would bring candles from home and uh, bring them into the church. And the next Advent, uh, they'd bring some more. Third Advent, they'd bring some more. And by the time you got to Eulita, the whole church would be filled with uh, candles celebrating that light that came into light in our way in a dark world. Skipping to verse 6, Isaiah then picks up then in Isaiah 9, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government, oh, that's the rule of God, the theme of the Bible, his kingdom, his government, and that's where you're going to find peace. You're not going to find it in the governments of this world. You're going to find it in his government as we submit to his rule over us. That's where you find peace. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's his name. My peace has a name. It's a person, not a thing. It's Jesus Christ. Of the greatness of his government and his peace, there'll be no end. There'll be no end. Submitting to that government, to the Prince of Peace, is where you're going to find this peace. A kingdom of peace ruled by the Prince of Peace, the child that was born to us. The kingdoms of this world may at times seek peace, a worldly peace, but of Jesus' kingdom, we read in Isaiah chapter 9, of the greatness of his government in peace, there will be no end. His is an eternal peace, without beginning, without ending, because he is eternal and he is peace. Men search for peace. The scripture teach that peace is only found in God. But people nonetheless try to find it in other places. That or they manufacture a false peace, a false sense that they're at peace. A person's desire for peace varies according to his or his circumstances. Some of the places that people search for peace, they search for peace in others or for people, in other people, community, that they might find peace. If only I could find the right person. Or if only I could find that Mayberry community and live there, I might have peace, the tranquil, easy life that we seek for. Settle down to the peaceful life. Secondly, people search for peace in material possessions. If only I had more money, more stuff, that might bring me a sense of security, then I, I might feel at peace. At peace. You know, part enticement with that is, is looking for peace and safety through money. If I have enough, if I live in a country that has a great army, they'll protect me. If we've got a good police force, they're looking for peace in all the wrong places. You know, I think insurance companies, you think that they uh, sell insurance, but if you really go back and look at insurance sales, what they're really selling, selling is what? Peace of mind. If you lose your stuff, we'll buy you new stuff. Whew. How much are you willing to pay for that peace of mind? We look for peace in all kinds of places. But how many people search for peace in God? 
in God. Psalm 4 8 says, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. You want safety, it's only found in the arms of God as we dwell or abide or continue in Him. Nothing in this world could give us that kind of peace. That kind of peace. Job 20, 21. Submit to God. There's that rule of God. And be at peace with Him. That's where it comes from. Coming back under the rule or the government of God under His kingdom. And that's where we find peace is in His kingdom. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in, listen to this, perfect peace. How do you like some of that? Perfect peace. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. That means they're not tossed to and fro with every teaching that comes down the pike. Or the latest Christian fad. Or all this dystopic teaching, you know, the end of the world, the sky has fallen, the sky has fallen. Right? Those who are steadfast because they... Trust in you. The trust is not in insurance companies or in any earthly government or any amount of security they think they have in the banks, in which there's no security there, really, if you think about it. It's a false security that we manufacture. It'll be gone in a second. A favorite old Bible story about peace, and it's more about forgiveness and love, but it does get to the peace a little bit later, is in Luke chapter 7, verses 37 through 50, a story I'm sure you're familiar with. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Again, blessed are the feet of those who come to preach good tidings, a fulfillment of the Isaiah passage. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, the Pharisee's name was Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. And so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him the more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my head. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her in the context of love and forgiveness, Your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And to kind of rub it in even more, Jesus says this. Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. You see, peace comes from Jesus Christ who forgives our sins and only He can have us go in peace. When we meet Him in a relationship of love like she did, when we receive by faith His amazing forgiveness, it is then and only then that we can go in that peace. Not the world's peace. The peace that Jesus Christ gives. For His kingdom is a kingdom of peace. In fact, if you look at the passages of Scripture in which God Himself is called the God of peace. Fancy word in the Greek, it's called a genitive of possession. What it means is, when He used that letter of, or that word sometimes of peace, it means it's His peace. He's the owner of it. For example, if I was to tell you, this is the watch of Jesse. Okay, whose watch is it? It's my watch. The peace, the God of peace. It's His peace. 
He gives it when we come to Him in faith, believing, receiving His forgiveness. It's then and only then that we can go in peace. Romans 15, 33, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with you. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. Peace is a way of life. And the God of love and peace will be with you. He's called the God of love and the God of peace. Philippians 4, 9, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. That's Philippians chapter 4 in Sunday school. We've been studying Philippians the last two weeks of how to have joy in suffering. Because you have a peace that comes from God given by Jesus Christ through faith that nothing in this world can touch or take that peace away unless you let them. In fact, Paul, this morning, we looked in Philippians 3, right before this chapter 4, he said, I count all the things of this world dung by comparison to my one thing, which is the knowing Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Hebrews 13, 20, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. And finally, 2 Thessalonians 3, 16, Now may the Lord of peace, he's called here, give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. That peace comes from him to those who submit to His kingdom, to His rule over them, who receive His forgiveness, receive His good news, His good tidings uh, by faith. Um, a little side note, as I'm on this subject this morning, but where, where does our world look for peace today? I mean, you can try yoga. It's okay. You can try meditation tapes. That can be peaceful and restful. But the peace the Bible talks about is only found in Jesus Christ, in God, the God of all peace, as we put our faith and trust in Him. In fact, if you want to measure that, when we have a peace problem, it's usually because we have a trust problem. Or we're walking in the flesh trying to provide a peace rather than trusting to his peace. Secondly, this morning, His is a kingdom of peacemakers. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus begins to teach about His revolutionary, upside-down kingdom, a kingdom that has never existed, that is not like anything on this earth, a kingdom of peace ruled by the Prince of Peace. We know them as the Beatitudes. Famous expositor G. Campbell Morgan called Jesus' address in Matthew 5 the manifesto of the kingdom because it is a kind of declaration of independence from the dead religious works of that day. It is a declaration that would ultimately contribute to the religionist hatred of Jesus and seeking his death. It was revolutionary. It still is today. It's not about an external list. It's about who you are inside. Jesus preached in His kingdom manifesto in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed, happy are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. The children of God. His is not only a kingdom of peace, it's supposed to be slapped full of peacemakers. You see, if you have made him your king, high and lifted up, and entered into his kingdom of peace, a child of the kingdom, you're supposed to be a peacemaker. So what is that? A peacemaker. It occurs only in the plural sense. Blessed are the peacemakers. In chapter 5 and verse 9 of Matthew, they shall be called the sons of God. God who is the God of peace. 
We have also what seems to be a reflection of this saying in James 3.18. James says, The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by them that make peace. That righteousness we receive through justification by faith, not a righteousness of our own. We spread. We spread it around. We show it. And it's seen in the lives of those who make peace. That's a peacemaker. In classical Greek, a peacemaker was also called an ambassador. Sent to seek a peace, a treaty, between two warring parties to try and strike an accord. A synonym for a peacemaker might be an ambassador, like in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. A righteousness which is seen in those who make peace. God's ambassadors. Ephesians 6, 19 through 20. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fiercely as I should. Paul, a preacher of the gospel, the good news of the peace that can only come through Jesus Christ. He was an ambassador, even though he was in change, which is amazing how God works things out for those who love him. Although he was a preacher and probably preferred to be preaching somewhere, or confronting some synagogue crowd, uh, if he doesn't get beat up and thrown in jail, as he often did. But instead, he's in chains in Rome, writing in the prison epistles. But he wrote most of our New Testament. So if he wasn't locked up, we wouldn't have the revelation we have today. So God used him to further the gospel in a way I can bet him gnashing at the beat. Oh man, all I can do is write these silly letters to the churches. I wish I was out there. But God works those, those things out. The word peacemaker in chapter 5 and verse 9 would probably better be translated if I was doing it in a modern English and breaking it down as peace workers implying not merely making peace between those who are at variance, but as ambassadors, peace workers, who promote peace, who try to get people to make peace with God. And of course, making peace with God is called reconciliation. To reconcile, or help them to be reconciled. So ours is a reconciliation ministry. It's what we're supposed to be doing as a church. We'll read that a little bit later. John Piper wrote, quote, Peacemaking tries to build bridges to people. It does not want the animosity to remain. It wants reconciliation. It wants harmony. The peacemaker, the ambassador, looks the enemy in the eyes and in love tells him he can be reconciled to God and his fellow man by repentance and faith in the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom, a kingdom of peace ruled by the Prince of Peace, unquote. Peace workers. It's what we do. A little final note here. Peacemakers or ambassadors for Christ are in the reconciliation business. And this is what they do. Romans 5.10 For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Hebrews 12.14 Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy without holiness. No one will see the Lord. Colossians 1, 19 through 22. For God was pleased to have all of His fullness dwell in Him, that's Jesus, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated, enemies from God, in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Reconciliation brought us unto God in that way. 
by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He reconciled us. Then we read an interesting passage in 2 Corinthians 5. 18 through 21. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And listen to this. Verse 18. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Peacemakers. Peace workers. That job is given to the church now. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Isn't it interesting? I've always told you before that churches think that's their job, counting people's sins against them. That's religion's job. It has nothing to do with Christianity. We're in the peacemaking business. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the very righteousness of God. Draw a conclusion this morning. How do we possess this peace? And how do we walk in this peace on an everyday basis so that we may be peacemakers or peace workers or ambassadors? Four things. There's a lot more than that, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you four main ones. Four ways in which we do that on a daily basis. First, through remaining or dwelling or abiding in Christ. That's how. You can't do it on your own. It's his peace. He said that he was reconciling the world and we are to reconcile as if he was reconciling the world through who? Through us. We're channels only. And the only way we can be part of that ministry if our channel is open for him to use. By remaining, dwelling, or abiding. Most important passage on that, of course, one of my favorites, John 15. I'm the vine, you're the branches. That's one of those chapters you just need to memorize, like 1 Corinthians 15 is the gospel. John 15 is the vine and the branches. Remain in me, or it is sometimes translated, uh, uh, dwell in me, or abide in me, is the old King James. Abide, dwell, remain, as I also remain in you. That's peace in you, by the way. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Remember, peace is the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there are no law. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. The ministry of peacemakers, of peace workers, can only be done as we abide in Jesus Christ daily. It's a decision we make every morning when we roll out of the sack. Like we looked at hope last week. Hope is putting Jesus Christ, that big candle, in the center of our lives. We decide to put him on the throne every morning when we roll out of bed or not. Or we stumble out the door forgetting to uh, put on the whole armor of God, forgetting to put him first or his will first in our lives. It has to be a priority in our lives. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things, the things that Jesus taught, so that in me you may have peace. Now that's subjunctive. It means you can have peace, but he's not guaranteeing it. It's up to you. It's up to you. And Jesus said, I've told you these things. And that's John 15. We're in John 16 now when he said that. If you abide in me. And I've told you these things. They're in John chapter 15. So that in me you may have peace. But see, you have to be in Him. you got to have faith. you got to be trusting Him. In this world, he says, you will have trouble. Trials and tribulations, that's also translated. But take heart. I've overcome the world, if you believe that. Faith. His peace in a troubled world, as you abide in Him... And as his words abide in you, 
That's the only way it takes place. Romans 5, 1 through 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace, in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Kiss that? Eh? We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who He has given to us. Secondly, how do we possess this peace and walk in this peace on an everyday basis? Through living by the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 6. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed, there's that rule of God again, ruled, the kingdom. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. That's Romans 8, 6. Like I've told you before, where you put your head, your butt follows. If you mind the things of this world and your mind's on the things of the flesh, or is your mind on heavenly things, on Jesus Christ? on His promises by faith. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Also Romans 14, 17 through 19 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. And again, if you look at the context there in Romans against the religionists, you know, touch not, taste not, handle not. That's what religion's about. Doing all this religious stuff. No, the kingdom of God, the rule of God is not a matter of those things. But here's what the kingdom of God is about. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Nothing will quench your peace or your joy or your hope anymore in religion. But living this new life in the Spirit, abiding in Christ, is righteousness, peace, and joy. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives approval of men. Let us therefore make every effort, an all-out effort, to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification, which means mutually build each other up in the most holy faith. It's a construction term. Thirdly, through obedience to God's Word. Through submitting humbly to His government, His rule, uh, that we see in His Word. Joshua 1, 8, 9. Keep this book of the law always before your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. But you've got to believe that. Don't be discouraged and don't be afraid because God's peace is available. And you will be discouraged and afraid if you're looking for that peace in this world. Psalm 119, 165, and 167 says this, Great peace have those who love your law, that's the word of God, and nothing can make them stumble. I wait for your salvation, Lord, and I follow your commands. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. Unquote. You want great peace? You've got to love the Word of God, abide and submit to it greatly. Fourthly, through prayer and meditation. A verse we all know, it's been our memory verse, and different variations of it, several times, but we're going to look at all of it, 6 through 9, Philippians 4. Do not be anxious, or that is, do not have anxieties about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and then in the peace of God. Did you catch that? Which transcends all understanding will guard. Not some bank account or insurance company or military army, but the peace of God which trans in will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, who is our peace, by the way. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. 
Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Again, where you put your head is where your butt follows. So Paul in Philippians says, think about good things. Finally, brothers, think on the honorable things, the, the right things, the, the pure things, the lovely things, the admirable things. But we live in a world that's full of peace dealers. In fact, what has marked our age, in fact, most of Hollywood, many of the books that are the bestsellers are called dystopia. You know, zombie apocalypses and the earth is going to end and, and oh, it's terrible, terrible, run, build a fallout shelter, uh, government's collapsing, uh, 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 you know, all of that, the Illuminati, rob you of your peace. Eh, I serve the Prince of Peace. Like we looked at in Philippians this morning, I'm an orphan here. I got my adoption papers signed and sealed. And my Abba Daddy's coming to get me. Now everything I own may be in my hefty bag, but I'm waiting on him. Nobody can steal my peace. As Paul said, I already suffered the loss of all things and count them but dumb. I got my toothbrush in my hefty bag. I'm ready to go. That's what Advent is about. Advent is about the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our peace, because peace, peace is a per person. Psalm 1, and I'll leave with that, great Psalm, Psalm 1, I like Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, probably my two favorites. But Psalm 1 writes, in, in the verse 3 verses, Blessed, happy, is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. You know how many mockers we got today? They don't have any solutions to anything. They just mock everything. Right? They got a criticism and a mocking of everything. You know what that does to you if you hang around folks like that? They steal your peace. Okay? Don't do that. Blessed is the one, happy is the one, who does not walk in step with the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf never withers and whatever they do prospers. Depends on how attached you are to the word of God or how much you're listening to the mockers and the evil in this world. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in you. Conclusion this morning. Speaking of possessing this peace and walking in this peace on an everyday basis. I want to share as I close with you a favorite prayer of mine. You know, I keep a prayer book and if I, if I, if I had that, uh, that hefty bag with all my possessions, I have one backpack. It has two things in it. I have stuck my toothbrush and my uh, shaving kit in there as well when I've gone on trips because I could lose all my other bags. It's the only bag I care about. It's got my Bible uh, wrapped up in a, in a leather satchel thing and my prayer book. And in that prayer book, I have a lot of prayers that I have saved over the years. And one of them is this prayer I'm going to share with you this morning as we close. It is a prayer by St. Francis of Assisi. Now that's around the time of 1181 to 1226, almost a thousand years ago. He was a friar who founded the Franciscan. He had survived the Crusades as a soldier from a wealthy family, sent off to fight the Holy War. You might say as you read about his struggles when he came back from war, he turned from the wealth of his family and the higher classes who sent him off to war. As it were, he was probably post-traumatic stress disorder, a term we use a lot today. It took him a long time to recover from the horrors that he saw of war. And so he wrote a prayer about peace because he'd seen the other side as well. In fact, to become a Franciscan, you had to take a vow of poverty, a vow of chastity, and a vow of obedience to become a Franciscan. He writes this in his prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. 
Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console others. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we ourselves are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. In other words, if you want to reap peace, you got to sow peace. Because we reap what we sow. And we are all to be peacemakers, peace workers, ambassadors in a world that so desperately needs real peace today. Let's close with a hymn this morning. Please stand as we sing number 245, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. of our benediction as we uh, go forth this morning.
covenant book of worship. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Do not return evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Guard the dignity of all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and with, remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.